the normal suspects are here. Ah, this is Okay, let's just... Waiting all day for this. That's the window. Uh -oh. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Good evening, you all right? I've been waiting for this all day. Um, your, your voice is breaking. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether it's uh, my uh, network or yours, but uh... Uh, if let's just try something. Might have to try something. I did wonder if I'd need it at some point. How are you, sir? Anyway, you're all right. Okay, is that better? Uh, let me. Is the sound better now? Hello? Uh, yep. Is that better now? Perfect. Hello. I've been waiting for this all day. Uh, still, I have uh, your echo uh, or the delay in your voice. Um, okay. Let me just uh, use the date. That's better, isn't it? I can hear you now. Uh, yeah, I'm using uh, my uh, data. So uh, this is what we did last week, wasn't it? We lost it a little bit last week. Yeah, uh, today my Wi-Fi should be better because uh, I'm uh, in my uh, uh, computer room. So okay. uh, well, what what I thought we'd talk about today is transition. Mm -hmm. Last week we talked about the the ground force and the shift and rotate, and and towards mm -hmm. the end of last week. We, you were talking about the importance of good transition in a golf swing. Mm -hmm. And I thought it'd be great to have a conversation with you about, about that. Because there's certain things that I've seen from players who've been to see you in relation to transition and things mm -hmm. that they, they've sort of told me. But I thought, you know, it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts on transition and what makes a good transition, you know, and the timings of it. Because, you know, I think there's, there's a massive importance for a golfer that if the transition is, is good, that they don't have to pull on the club or, you, you know, or, or I said pull on the club is probably the best way to pull it to try and create speed. So I thought, you know, this, this, this mm -hmm. idea, when, when is the transition starting to happen? What's actually happening? Uh, in my... In my definition, uh, transition is uh, the period from uh, pelvis transition point to a club transition point. So in other words, uh, when the pelvis finishes rotation and then start rotating in the downward direction, and then finally the club changes the direction. So that period is, uh, uh, in my definition, uh, the transition period or transition phase. And generally, uh, in terms of transition phase, um, we talk about the transition sequence a lot. So when the body uh, uh, changes the direction, uh, the pelvis or the hips uh, change the direction first, and then the chest, shoulder girdles, arms, and then club. So uh, uh, we commonly call this a proximal to a distal uh, transition sequence or central to a peripheral uh, transition sequence. So uh, in terms of a uh, transition uh, pe uh, phase, we talk a lot about the transition sequence. But another really important aspect is uh, what the lower body does during the transition phase. So while the, uh, the body parts are changing the direction, your lower body is still working with the ground 
and then uh, increase the, the torque generated uh, through uh, the golfer ground interaction. So on one hand, you are changing the direction uh, in the upper part, part of the body. But at the same time, your lower body uh, works with the ground uh, and then uh, starts uh, generating uh, you know, really uh, favorable uh, initial conditions for the downswing. So uh, these two big things are happening uh, during the transition phase. Okay, and that, that sort of change in direction and transition is starting well before the club gets to the top. So the, the, the body prepares for uh, the downswing way earlier. That's, uh, that's true. So what happens is um, always when we have a change in direction, then what happens is that before that you have a, a, a speed up in the opposite direction and then slow down in the opposite direction, then change the direction and then speed up in the, uh, the main direction and then slow down at the end. So uh, obviously the transition point is where the change in direction happens. But in order to uh, you know, make that happen, your body prepares way earlier. So uh, basically it's changing the direction of torque generated. So initially uh, speeding up of the backward rotation and then at some point it will start the decelerating, slowing down the backswing. And then finally when it stops, then it will change the direction. So actually, your body starts uh, in preparing for the transition way earlier. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if if I'm if I'm right in thinking, then as I as I start to if we go back to last week where it was shift then turn shift then turn, as as my arms are still going this way or on the way back, my body's mm -hmm. now preparing by going this way with it yeah. little little shift to the left, but, mm -hmm. and then. As a result of that, I'm creating this um, disassociation between my pelvis and my ribcage, my arms. Yeah, so what that causes a central to a peripheral uh, transition sequence. But at the same time, because of the shift of motion, your lower body is working with the ground. So it actually uh, starts using the ground really well. So by the time you reach the club transition point, or the top of X-ring, that you already have a large torque acting on your body, which can be used uh, in the downswing uh, to accelerate your body right away. And that, that, that initial um, reaction with the ground, the, the, the almost the, the faster that goes early, the greater mm -hmm. speed I can create. Yeah, so basically, uh, if you have an active backswing, uh, active backswing means a reasonably uh, speedy, backswing, but at the same time, you're using your body uh, during the backswing. When this happens, you will naturally have a continuous transition to a downswing. So when this happens in a row, then uh, uh, at the uh, later part of the backswing, you will start using your body to reverse the direction. Yeah, yeah. So you, you start the preparation early on, and then during the transition phase, you will actually see good central to a peripheral uh, transition sequence. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then once the downswing starts, then you will have really you have good uh, initial condition. So that will allow you to accelerate the, the body early on. And that, as that's happening in the active backswing, that's obviously then creating more. Yeah. More, so say, more and more stretch. Yeah. So the active backswing. Active vaccine gives you a lot of momentum of the upper upper body. So it has a tendency to continue that motion. But when you uh, reverse the direction of, uh, of the pelvis motion by using the legs, then you have a good separation. And then finally the upper body follows. So, so would I be right thinking then that, that that stretch is just getting greater and greater and greater and greater all the way through transition? So uh, until uh, in terms of... In terms of the uh, X factor stretch, uh, I basically divide it into two uh, 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 stretches. One is uh, the increase in the X factor during the backswing. So, uh, you know, from the uh, pelvis transition point to top of backswing, during uh, that period, how much increase in the X factor? That's a backswing stretch. And then once uh, the downswing starts, so every body part, all body parts are now rotating in the downswing direction. But you, you can still have a bit more increase in the X factor. It's called a downswing stretch. Yes. So in the 
uh, backswing stretch because the upper part is rotating in the backward direction, but the lower part is rotating in the down, downward direction. So that gives you uh, the, that stretch. Uh, it, uh, in the downswing stretch, what happens is uh, all parts are now rotating in the downward direction, but because the pelvis is rotating faster than uh, the upper part, so you have a little bit more stretch. But um, uh, generally speaking, the, down, uh, the backswing stretch is uh, important. You have to uh, increase the backswing stretch by having sort of a fast, speedy backswing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. If if you try to create the large downswing stretch, then you have to move your pelvis a lot at the beginning of the downswing. So that uh, you know, oftentimes causes a sliding of the pelvis toward the target too much, yeah. or you have to open open the pelvis too early. So instead of uh, try to generate the stretch. Uh, during the downswing, early part of downswing, rather in increase the stretch during the backswing. Yeah, yeah. And, and if, if you don't increase that stretch in the backswing, then surely you can't get to the same speed in relation to the well, you speed can, of the club you can and the, um, the torque, the horizontal torque. So you can still generate a similar velocity or similar clever speed, but you have to put a lot more effort. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So if you want to make the swing easier, uh, in terms of the uh, efficiency of the swing, uh, there are two main things uh, in my perspective. One is uh, how well you use the ground. In, in using the ground, instead of, putting, uh, instead of increasing your effort, okay, you, you just maintain your effort but by elongating the moment arm, so you will be able to generate a, a larger torque. So uh, in terms of the uh, torque generation, the moment arm uh, plays a, an important role. So that's a, a big uh, part of uh, swing efficiency. Another one, is, the second part is how you use your muscles. Yeah. And then uh, we have something called the stretch shortening cycle uh, in biomechanics. This, this is one of uh, the key uh, biomechanical principles, but um, when you activate your muscles in a stretch shortening cycle fashion, then it puts the, uh, the least burden. So uh, you will actually be able to keep the level of activation of your muscle low, but still you will be able to generate the sufficient force. So along the way, during the swing, if you use the ground well, then you will be able to uh, generate large torque without putting a lot of effort. Uh, okay. e even in terms of muscular effort, if you uh, activate the muscles in a stretch shortening cycle fashion, then you are actually uh, activating the, the muscle less. So it's uh, easier. So uh, these are all, uh, you know, contribute to the efficiency of the swing. And, and if, 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 if that, um, that sequence goes in that, that order then, this, this club then that we're, we're holding, that almost looks like, let's say, I've got a club, that now looks like it's going towards me, not away from me. It's hard to actually drop the club uh, toward your body. But um, you know, as uh, the, the arm rotates, the club will still move out. But if the arm rotates more, then the, the cocking actually increases. Uh, it's called the down, yeah, down cocking. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. If, if, mm -hmm. But obviously there, the the hands, there's obviously a force on the handle that I'm producing. Yeah. But what it, but is it just the sequence that is allowing that angle to stay there or increase? So when you have a really good uh, central to a peripheral sequence or proximal to distal sequence, essentially at the beginning of the downstream, you're using your body a lot. So you, you focus on uh, a, a angular acceleration of the body then you have less emphasis on what your hand, hands and uh, uh, you know, the arms do. So naturally, uh, in the process of, uh, uh, in, the, in the early phase of downswing, what happens is uh, if this is club here, yeah. as, you, as you come down, your hand is pushing the handle out. Okay. So you have a natural tendency of uh, cocking. Yes. If you just use this, this force. But at the same time, you have a wrist action. Yeah which is op opposing to that. So it's always a matter of balance between, uh, you know, this rotation, the tendency of this rotation because of the hand force, and also this tendency 
due to the wrist action. So if your wrist action is too much, then what happens is you have a casting action. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or although uh, you, you don't have a apparent casting, but uh, if you pull the arm quite a bit with a relatively rigid uh, wrist complex here, it's just a try to pull the arm, that with the rotation of the arms, the club will also rotate. So oh, it yeah. generates a similar effect to uh, casting, although it's not too bad, you know. So, so, what, so when, when the hands are coming downwards, and we're, we're basically pushing this way, aren't we? To make yeah, we are, we, are, we are pushing outward, yes. Is so it, if this is a club, we're pushing that way. So would you yeah, say, it has a tendency here. Would you say with that that you're pushing with your left hand or your right hand? To, to but the, remember, remember here, you are not intentionally pushing this. Yeah. So when, when you start thinking that you are intentionally pushing, then it screws, screws up your swing. Okay, I've got you. So in your part, all you need to remember is that you are just moving your hand following a relatively circular path. When you move your hand following that path, then automatically the interaction between your hands and club will give you a force going outward. So when, as soon as you uh, try to do this uh, intentionally, then you screw up things. Oh, okay. And, and yeah. that, that um, pushing outwards, so this way, at what point is that then maximized? Is that halfway down, is that maximized? Or? Um, it, uh, you, know, you can see some individual differences, but... Um, if I remember it correctly, the outward force becomes a maximum uh, so when the club is about this position here. Okay. Yeah, so uh, it comes down about here. Yeah. Around the here, uh, oh, no, no. So around the here, the force becomes uh, outward to inward. It uh, changes the direction. Yeah. And I don't remember exactly at what point uh, you have the uh, maximum force, but... Uh, um, I can certainly look at the data and then but, maybe if we have another chance yeah. then I can probably give you the but, data. But ultimately they're pulling it down and it's staying there as long as you can. So you can certainly uh, you know, uh, drag the club as much as possible instead of letting the club go out. So uh, pulling the club down is also easier than, uh, than using your wrist and then try to uh, throw it out that way. I think I think because... I think that's that's an area that a lot of golfers get wrong as a, as an amateur golfer because they're all trying to hit the ball further, and in order to try and hit the ball further, they pull at the club. So mm. this this angle that's at the top, instead of kind of going like goes like that, and and not realizing that what they're doing is rotating that club around that circle instead of yeah. it, it almost following on a... So you can, you can look at the, uh, if this is the top position here, and then if you look at the, the direction the club head is moving, if uh, at the top, if the club head moves this way, then you have a lot of casting action here. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. if you just uh, let it come down, then the, the club head moves like this. So if you just attract the, the path of the club head, then you will see if the club head path is uh, close to upright, then you have a lot of uh, cast, casting action. And if you, you just uh, drop it and then uh, let, it, let it go, then the club head pretty much moves in this direction uh, at the beginning of the downswing. Which is amazing, really, when you think that, you know, you're, the way in which the actual forces are working relative to what, you know, people try and do to produce, produce speed. So when yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we typically think that the, if you let the club go out, then it will be able to increase the club speed, but exactly the opposite. Yeah. Initially, you uh, suppress this uh, wrist motion and then just to bring the club along the hand pad. Later, it will go out and then hit the ball and have a really high club speed. So... Um, this this club's coming down. I'm I'm holding on to it there, and at some point then, that that club's now got to come to line up with the ball, mm. and and 
back towards me, hasn't it? So uh, on the way down, what happens is the, 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 because the club center of mass is uh, behind here. Yeah. And then your hand is changing the direction. And the inertia of the club will uh, let the uh, club go outward. And so all you need to do is uh, bring it down and then meet the ball. Now I'm so you don't, have, you don't have to do a lot of wrist action, but bring it down and then meet the ball. Then you will be able to maximize the club speed. And am I right in thinking it's easier to increase the club head speed if the club head stays closer to you? Yes, that's the, that's the key. That's the key. So particularly uh, you know, on the way down, when you have a lead arm parallel to the ground, and then look at where the club is. And if the club is generally close, uh, close to the body, then you have uh, potential to increase the club speed quite a bit. But if the club is uh, already away here, close to the vertical position here, then no matter uh, you know, how much money you spend, there's no way <laughs> to increase the club speed. Okay. So, so, so early on in the downswing, early on your main focus is to accelerate your body, angularly accelerate your body. So when your body has a lot of motion, later that motion can be transferred to uh, the club, then that's where the club uh, gains a lot of club speed. But if you let it go early on, then your body uh, does not have that much mo motion. So your club has uh, you know, reasonably uh, more cl uh, club speed early on, but it does not increase that much. That's the problem. And how much do you see with, let's say, amateur golf, club working away? Or even with good players, you know, the, how, how, much, how many times do you see club working away just because they're trying to do it with their hands? In, uh, in uh, amateur players, you, you see this commonly. Even I, I do this, you know, although I know all these uh, you know, <laughs> theories, but sometimes I, I do this. But in, the, in the skilled golfers, among the skilled golfers, what's more uh, uh, common is just moving the arms and club as a one unit. So you have a kind of rigid wrist here, so moving them together. So as the arm rotates, the club also rotates. That gives you an early motion of the club. So it's not as much as a casting action, but you have something similar. So the worst is, um, you know, if you don't have enough backswing, so uh, the club at the top, club is about here. So you, you don't even reach this position here. So your club is about here, and then pull everything down together. Then from the beginning, you have a disadvantage because you don't have enough uh, cocking here. Yeah. But on the way down, you are moving the arms and club together. So uh, the club moves away. So by the time you reach this uh, lead on parallel position, your club is already quite away from your body. So this is a good indicator. If the club is uh, at the lead on parallel position, if the club is uh, away from your body, then no matter uh, you know, how famous you are or how much money you have, it doesn't matter. You will not be able to increase the club speed that much unless you use your muscles like crazy. So it, in a, let's say in a, in a, in a way, when I get up to the, to the top of my back, really, I'd be better off with almost slightly less angle, say 90 degrees, not 100. So a little shorter and wider. So as I change direction, I can move my body and I've still got some range of motion to create that. Angle. So here, here. Uh, instead of thinking what you do in terms of the, the direction you're pulling this down, forget about it. Just to forget about it. And then have enough uh, cocking here. You don't have to go all the way, uh, you're passing the horizontal line here. So about here. Maybe this is okay. But as you start the downswing, forget about what your arms and the wrists are doing. Pay attention to what your lower body does. Yeah. If you, you start moving your lower body, then naturally it comes down like this. But if you use your arms, then club moves away. So uh, sometimes in order to uh, generate certain uh, favorable motion, you actually uh, you do certain things and it actually uh, uh, screws, uh, screws up your swing. So oftentimes by directing your attention to uh, something external, forget about what you do here. And then uh, just to try to move the body, then it naturally comes down. You have a really good leg.
and then uh, we would be able to keep the club uh, close to your body. And, and it, like like you said last week, if if we have the active backswing, and we you know we we turn in the right way, and we can our focus should really be on what our body's doing, what our legs are doing, in order to change direction to allow everything then to to follow. We got to, We've almost got to think sequence. And, and so you have a, when you have active backswing. You don't have to worry about how high you go, okay? Whether you have to stop here or you let it go a bit more, because of the momentum of the body, it, it has a tendency to keep moving, and then as your lower body starts uh, preparing for it, it will naturally stop this. Yeah. And then if you have to uh, let it go a bit, go a bit farther, uh, so that it pass, it uh, crosses the horizontal line, that's okay. Okay. So initially, don't worry about this. Just the uh, throw the club and then let it go and then your body will start uh, you know, working with the ground. Then you will have a natural stop somewhere and then just to follow. So early on, you are not really using your arms intentionally. Okay. So, so at what point would you be using your arms? You are, use, you are using your arms obviously always, but... Uh, yeah. Just no... So, so the uncocking starts uh, right before... If you have really good uh, delayed release, then uh, yeah. the uncocking starts right before this position. So about here, you will see the uncocking starts. Okay, but worst, the worst case, uh, you know, before even you reach the top position, you already start uncocking. Yeah. Some people do that, yeah. and then also some people who are uh, who intentionally try to drop the club head. So in the frontal view, if you drop the club head backward, then it looks like you have a lot of uh, wrist cocking. Yeah. But it's just a pers perspective error, uh, error. And if you look at it in the swing plane view, some people in intentionally try to drop the club head backward and then come around your body. Then what happens? You have early uncocking followed by slight uh, recocking and then later un uncocking again. So uh, because of your intentional wrist action to drop the club down. So depending on uh, you know, the way you, tr you try to do the uh, transition, there will be some different uh, 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 you know, styles. But uh, the bottom line is if you just let the body rotate with the momentum of the backswing, and then your body prepares for the downswing, then what happens is uh, the uncocking starts about here. So right before the, uh, per uh, the lead on peril to the you know, to a ground. So about this position, you will see the uncocking starts. And, and you, you mentioned there um, shallowing, which, which I, I think has been a big uh, fashion in the golf industry, <laughs> probably for the last <laughs> might be the best way yeah. to describe it. Yeah. Right? So if, if a club is shallowing, right, which I think... If I look at your three three dimensional stuff, club goes back onto functional swing plane early mm. and stays on it all the way through. What is it that produces that shallowing? Uh, because uh, you let it go, and then part of it is uh, the gravity. But uh, also from this position, your body is moving. Your body is moving here, so you are just uh, dropping this. Okay, it's a nat natural motion here, and also remember. Be, uh, because the anatomy of the body, okay, during the backswing, when you try to rotate, and at some point you, you will notice that you cannot rotate this anymore unless you bring your arms up. Yeah. If you just uh, try to rotate the body about the spine axis, then you have a limit here. But in order to go a bit farther, you will lift the arms to a certain extent, right? Yes. So on the way down, we have the same thing. On the way down, you will first lower the arm, and then, there you go. And is the, lowering, is the lowering of the arms almost the result of the fact that the lower body is going first to give you that time? Because you, you're almost creating that little yeah. stretch, aren't you? Pelvis to exactly. change, exactly. to come down. So, so in, in our imaging, in our imaging, it's okay to think that you're always moving the arms and club uh, along the swing plane. But because of the uh, anatomical limitation toward the end of the backswing, you have to bring it up slightly, right? And also at the, uh, on the way down, you will naturally drop it and then let it go. So, you know, in our image, we don't have to intentionally try to lift it up or uh, drop it. 
Because if we just think that we're moving the arms and the club along the swing plane, then the anatomy will take care of it, naturally. And, and is there, is there a, let's say, an advantage to the, to the club being higher? Mm-hmm. At the top? To a certain extent. Because there, 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 there could be, let's say, different uh, models where someone could swing in their arms lower, or it could be, you know, a lot higher, or it could be on the shoulder. It, is the, it, what, what would be the advantage there to, let's say, being higher? It's not the posture itself, but rather you have to look at the history of uh, the motion of the club and the arms. So even though two uh, golfers may show the same uh, posture here, but depending on how you reach that posture, in other words, during the backswing, how you move your arms and club to reach that position, that changes uh, the whole thing. So uh, one benefit of going a bit higher and then dropping this. So this will give you a natural uh, um, shallowing of the club. Okay. So you don't have the intention to pull it down. Got, yeah. So you go sli- uh, you know, slightly higher than your swing plane. Go up and then just uh, drop it a little bit. That's natural. But usually, in, uh, not usually, but uh, what, sometimes what we see here is uh, intentional shallowing. So you try to drop the club at quite a bit well, intentionally. I was going to say to you, I have seen, I have seen different ways of doing this. So a shallowing, whether it be by the wrist joint or by the the club or or by twisting the arm, in, in all different ways to try and get this club to mm-hmm. to shallow mm-hmm. out. So what we mm-hmm. what we're saying from a scientific perspective is because the arms are higher that club can lower down onto the line. And then we'll so, so here is the, the key point that, that uh, I, I try to make. Instead of uh, thinking what you do here, this is just the one point you are passing through because you have your backswing connected to the downswing, right? Yeah. So you are con- continuously moving and you are just uh, passing through one point here. So what you do here, th- this, that, if this is an arm-driven swing, then it matters. Because in arm, arm-driven swing, you have to do everything with your arms. So whether you go this way or, you know, go high up, these matters. But when you have uh, active backswing connected to downswing, then it's just a, a point you are passing through, and then the importance uh, diminishes. So what matters is uh, just repeat the swing back and forth many times. And see how your body moves. That is the key there. And, so and instead of in, intentionally try to uh, manipulate them. And and you know when you see the the better players in your lab, you know is that what stands out? Is the is the sequence and the ability to to change direction? Um, I have to admit that the, even uh, you know, top players uh, who are playing on the PJ Tour. Their swing, oftentimes, is not ideal. So, but uh, I think it's a, it's a because of the uh, the nature of golf. In golf, uh, your goal is to uh, just to produce a good score, right? Yeah. Uh, you are not really putting your your hundred percent effort uh, in, in the swings, and then also uh, you know you have different ways to uh, basically uh, uh, move the ball to the to the hole. So because of that, usually good, uh, good players uh, means uh, they know how to uh, manipulate the, uh, you know, the, the play and then uh, keep the score low. But uh, purely in the perspective of uh, you know, biomechanics, then even uh, the top players have a lot of errors uh, they are lacking. Uh, but um, in general, uh, if you look at those who can generate high speed, I, I don't know whether I mentioned this last time, but... Uh, Clever speed is a good indicator of uh, the quality of uh, biomechanics uh, you know, in the swing. So if someone fails to uh, generate uh, high enough speed, that means the person has a, a cancer-like uh, yeah. uh, problems in the, in the movement. So uh, I, I use uh, clever speed as an indicator uh, for that. But um, in general, those who are generating high clever speed and also are doing uh, you know, dynamic movement, they all have some common things. Uh, first, uh, the backswing is uh, fairly uh, speedy. 
then uh, you don't uh, pause up there, but you have a continuous transition to downswing. And then also, in order to uh, uh, have a dynamic swing, your body has to have uh, up and down motion. I was, I was the, gonna, uh, the, that's, I was the gonna come to that, because cause everything we've discussed has been um, rotational, horizontal, and also uh, the, the arm thing. You know, what, what impact then have we got with the up and down and how does that fall into what we're doing in terms of the timing? So when we have a more up and down rhythm here, okay, that will definitely increase the, the interaction with the ground. You have increased force. But then the only thing is you just direct the force in the right direction. As long as the force does not pass through your center mass, then this vertical force can generate torque. So that's the key. Some people think uh, if you have a vertical force, a large vertical force acting, it has nothing to do with the clever speed, but it's incorrect. If this is the center of mass, if your force passes through the center of mass, then that's tr uh, it's true. Even if you increase the, this force, but still, uh, you know, it only gives you more up and down motion. Yeah. But if the force, force is going like this, you have a large force here, it's not passing through the center of mass, then you have this uh, moment arm here. Because of that, this force actually gives you a good amount of torque. So the vertical interaction, the vertical force, definitely uh, uh, contribute to uh, the, the torque you generate uh, through the use of ground. So the vertical um, rhythm is really important. And if you uh, uh, correlate all these uh, motion uh, uh, parameters with the clever speed, actually, you may not see uh, significant correlations uh, between the horizontal motion uh, uh, parameters and the clever speed, but you do have uh, significant correlations between the vertical motion parameters and the clever speed. And also, if you look at the golfers, in terms of the horizontal motion, you know, golfers do all sorts of things. You have very different styles uh, coexisting. But in terms of the vertical uh, rhythm, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Either you move, you move your center of mass flat or you have uh, up and down motion. Once you have up and down motion, then it definitely contributes to a uh, clever speed. So, um, and, is the up, and is the up and down motion that, uh, that can create more speed, is that harder to control in relation to the delivery of the club? Not, not really. You are not really uh, flexing the both knees uh, together at the same time here. Actually, you're going like this. Okay. Yes. So uh, if one side goes high up, then the other side goes down. So with that motion, you are actually uh, generating uh, the, uh, the vertical uh, dynamics. So as I said, that stepping like action is really good because uh, if you take steps, okay, it doesn't have to be a, a big step. You don't have to lift your foot really high. This is just a matter of maybe lifting the heel only. But when you have this kind of leg action, that gives you good the vertical uh, uh, interaction. Yeah, yeah. And with that, you can also push the ground laterally at the same time by pushing and the laterally, pushing down laterally. So that way, you will be able to have both vertical interaction and the horizontal interaction at the same time. And in, in that process, your head does not move up and down that much. Yeah. It's more, more about uh, taking turns and then pushing the ground. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I know um, Alison had a go at it earlier with, with a kettlebell. And she could feel because of the weight that she, she couldn't pull the kettlebell. She had to just let it swing and then move and then let it swing yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. more to, to, to get a feel of the, of the rhythm and the motion so it moved in the right timings. Yeah, so when you deal with the weight, it's heavier than the club, obviously. So you cannot easily manipulate the motion. So you have to respect the weight of the kettlebell. So on the way down, they just drop and then add your force. So as you drop the kettlebell, you're moving your, your lower body. And then by pushing the left leg hard, they throw the kettlebell up. So uh, basically when you uh, swing the kettlebell back and forth repeatedly, then your body eventually will learn how to uh, work with the, the weight. So naturally you develop a good rhythm. And, and we, we've used that as well with, with the rope for the same thing. And, mm -hmm. and you're amazed mm -hmm. how, how the rope can react like the shaft of a golf club. 
on, on yeah. the way around and back. Yeah, a good friend of mine, uh, Rob Holding, uh, you know, in, the, in Vancouver, he always demonstrates how to hit the ball with the rope. So you can actually <laughs> hit the ball. That's a good piece of yeah. rope. I don't think yeah, that's big enough. <laughs> These young kids, uh, they can do uh, you know, some amazing things, and they can they actually swing the rope and they hit the ball. And sometimes the ball can be uh, fast enough to uh, make a hole on on the wall. Okay, so uh, wow, yeah. So That's... you will see. Uh, it depends on uh, what kind of rope you are using, but uh, you know the rope swing can be quite fast. And and the thing with the rope is, if you don't move the body properly. The rope's all <laughs> over the place. Yes. You know what I mean? Especially through impact. Or, you know what I mean? So as you're coming <laughs> through with the rope, if you're trying to pull the rope or bend the arm, the, the rope's all over the place. You almost got to stabilise the <clears> rope <throat> yeah. with the movement of the body. And I think <clears> you, can, you sense how, how your, your upper body, definitely, let's say, your, your left shoulder, your left, and everything can come through to allow the rope to keep going. So that's how uh, you uh, practice uh, to uh, respect the, uh, the mass and uh, inertia of the rope. So if you try to intentionally manipulate the rope motion with your arms, it goes everywhere. If you pull it uh, too, uh, too flat, then it goes uh, back and then eventually it will cling on uh, to your neck. And then if you lift it up, then again, it will just drop on your body. So you have to uh, guide the rope along the swing plane. Okay? And then uh, in doing that, you have to minimize your body motion. Uh, you, know, you don't do any excessive motion. So the rope will tell you uh, how to uh, work with uh, you know, the rope uh, to generate the consistent uh, back and forth movement. And then with that, you will naturally find your swing plane. Okay? If, uh, the, if uh, the rope is moving away from the swing plane, then you will see that uh, if you, you go a bit steeper, then later you will drop on your body. If you go flatter, then you will uh, you know, end up here. Yeah. So if you, if you want to keep the rope uh, over the right shoulder and then on the left armpit here, yeah. if it wraps around like this, that means that you're pretty much guiding the rope along the swing plane. And when you say swing plane, what, what, is there a sort of a guide that we, you could, we could look at as an, as an ideal, you know, um, um, to when we're just looking at it on the camera, uh, you know, many people use uh, uh, in the setup position in the down the line view use uh, lines to show that the shoulder shoulder plane, yeah, and then uh, the shaft plane and then the elbow plane, right? Yeah. So the elbow plane is quite close to uh, the typical uh, swing plane. Oh, okay. So, yeah, and then the elbow plane basically it passes through the mid section of the trunk. Yeah. And uh, that's a good, uh, you know, uh, estimate of uh, the swing plane. At what point is the club on that plane? Uh, it depends on how you move your club, but particularly, uh, you know, uh, from the top of uh, back swing position. If you tend to use your arms a lot, so you, you pull the club down, then you tend to have a stiffer swing plane. Okay. And then if you intentionally drop your club head, and then try to bring the club around your body, then you tend to have a fairly uh, flat uh, uh, swing plane. So if, or if, if, if your pelvis collapses during the downswing, you are using your arms a lot, so your pelvis just collapses, yeah. then you tend to have a flatter swing plane. So in order to have a reasonable swing plane, then at the beginning, you move your body, and then let the, cl uh, let the arms in the club uh, drop to overcome the anat anatomical limitation, right? Yeah. And then when it's uh, in position, then you let it go. Okay. So that means um, usually, uh, so uh, I classify the swing styles based on uh, the relative uh, club head path uh, to the swing plane. But uh, so the first style is uh, the so-called planar swing. In the planar swing, your swing plane serves as the lower bound. And at the top, the club head is located above the swing plane. And on the way down, it quickly moves toward the swing plane and stays on the swing plane nicely. And then uh, after the mid follow through, then it will start moving up again. So that's a planar swing. Uh, spiral swing means uh, 
you're, you're using your arms quite a bit. So uh, the club head moves around here, and then it doesn't quite uh, come, comes down to the string plane quickly. So even uh, at the mid downswing, uh, which means uh, the, the club is uh, parallel to the ground, even at that point, the club head is not on the string plane yet. And then after the mid follow through, again, the parallel position, the club head moves below the string plane. So you are starting from high position, comes down to the string plane, and then it goes below the string plane. So it essentially shows a spiral uh, yeah. path. So that's a spiral uh, pattern. And then the other, uh, the last one is a reverse spiral. So at the top, because you are dropping your clavet quite a bit. Yeah. So the, uh, at the beginning, early on, the clavet stays below the swing plane. And then later, at, uh, in the follow-through phase, you will see big deviation of the clavet from the swing plane. So you end up with a really high position. Yeah. Drop it and then try to lift it, lift it high. So that's called a reverse uh, spiral. But... Uh, it's hard to uh, explain these without showing the computer screen, I, but... I, uh... I know exactly. I, I, can <laughs> I can just visualize this, if, if I'm using an iPad, this mm. line, let's say, on, on your, your elbow plane and being pretty close to that. And obviously, yeah. if you are slightly above it, you're going to start moving to try and get into position, aren't you? Which is going to throw you under mm. it and then over it. Mm. You know, and you can just see it falling under and over and co constantly be, being offline. So the style variation dictates the, the slope of the swing plane to a certain extent. But the main uh, parameter is the height of the golfer. The taller the golfer is, steeper the uh, swing plane is. That's, a, that's a true. So um, the, the height of the golfer is a, a, domin a dominating factor, a dominant factor. And then the style differences, whether you're using your arms a lot or whether you're using your low body well or, you know, you're dropping the club head, these also uh, affect the, uh, the slope of the swing plane. Um, so, But I could, if you look that, at the... I could do that drill with a rope to feel the body and see how, and, and be able to get that rope on that swing plane. Yeah, so you, if you can swing the rope back and forth following a consistent plane, yeah. then that means uh, that's uh, your swing plane. That's uh, something you have to go for, with the, even with the club. Because, that, because I could swing the rope around me, thinking I'm doing it well, and be nowhere near the, plane, the swing plane, if I was doing it wrong. But if I was using my body properly, and I, I sort of, I stood myself to the side of it to record myself, and I was making the, the move with the body, I'd actually see that rope staying on that swing plane mm. much more and I, i'd probably find that really easy to then look that would be that could almost be my model for using my body and then if yeah. I, if i then hit a shot with a golf club that's probably similar length to the rope you know then i could yeah. i could see the difference between a body movement and a arm movement with the golf club mm. and mm -hmm. i've never thought of that before i think that's that in my mind would be really interesting to, to, to look, especially so, if I was hitting the ball with rope. Yeah, so uh, the, the usefulness of the rope drill is that um, first you will learn how to move the rope you know, consistently by guiding the rope with your body properly. So if your body does something uh, incorrectly, then uh, the rope goes all over. So at least the first you, you should be able to swing the rope back and forth consistently. And then when that happens, that is close to your swing plane as well. So uh, it's a, a, a good tool to find your swing plane. And, and all, you know, all, all the, the, the players who find their swing plane, how much more accurate are they when they're on that swing plane? Uh, this is, a, we, we have not done any study uh, really comparing the accuracies, but uh, so I have to speak uh, out of my experience. Um, so recently, uh, I had uh, in, uh, opportunities to work with the professional golfers. Okay, and then uh, so when I uh, promote the uh, more active swing, active backswing, followed by a, a continuous uh, transition to downswing, all these things. So in other words, a rhythmic swing. Then what you see commonly is first uh, the, the the distance increases obviously, 
in some cases, uh, even at the professional level, you can uh, see a 30 yard gain in the distance. Wow. With, with that, with that, also the, uh, the direction control improves. So you can see, uh, you know, the ball is, uh, has a less uh, scattered shots. But interestingly, as soon as the distance starts increasing, what you will notice at the same time is the swing plane gets a bit flatter. So what happens is that uh, when you use your, your arms a lot, then you tend to uh, have the swing plane steeper than your ideal uh, swing plane, let's say. But as you start using the rhythmic swing and then uh, you're using your body a lot better in an in, uh, in orchestrated uh, uh, fashion, then what happens is your swing plane also flattens toward uh, the, uh, the, I may say, uh, the ideal swing plane. And with that, the speed starts increasing because you know by instinct that the, when you swing the, the club and the arms, following the swing, uh, ideal swing plane, then you can swing it harder using your body a lot more effectively. And also, it doesn't cause any instability and I, in the I, swing motion. I presume that if the club is swinging down in this direction, and the, let's say the force out the handle is almost coming back towards the body as you collide with it, then mm. it's, it's, it's got to be squarer than if the handle was being dragged through or pulled through. So, uh, you know, oftentimes you see people uh, using an impact bag that try to hit it hard, hit, hit hard impact bag. But I don't quite understand the intention behind it, but the, if the intention is to increase the level of effort at impact, that's uh, incorrect. That's uh, very uh, 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 ill-intended because at the instant of impact, most of the force is acting toward your body. Why? Because the club, is, club tends to move away from your body because of the inertia. Yeah. On the way down, you have a constant change in direction. So uh, the club wants to uh, you know, continue the motion. So uh, it wants to move away from your body. Uh, for example, in a rainy, uh, on a rainy day, when uh, your hands are you know, wet, when you try to swing hard, then you will, you will see in which direction the club goes when it slips, right? So the club has a tendency to move away from your body and you are holding the club. You don't let the club go away. That's why you have a large force acting toward your body at the instant, uh, at the instant of uh, impact. In other words, in order to uh, increase this effort, all you need is to throw the club out more and you hold it. You don't let the club actually go away from your body. So that's what happens. So uh, toward the impact, all you need is uh, let the club go out and hold it and then just to control the pace, yeah. then that's how you can hit the ball uh, more consistently. So the swing gets easier because uh, you're generating the speed with uh, your body. And then for the arms, all they need to do is uh, guide the club. And then at impact position, you just to control the pace. And then, uh, you know, the speed is already there. So uh, if, you can, if you can get that body working, so that you can use the rope. You could probably have different, um, uh, how to put it, uh, let's say flexors of a rope or, or shaft or something that enables you to, to, to not pull on it and then gradually brings you closer to a golf club. So, mm -hmm. so the rope's uh, it can, flexible. But it can be a good strategy, even, uh, you can go from, uh, you know, kettlebell, let's say, and then uh, something lighter, they eventually come to all the way to uh, your club. Uh, so always, uh, but this is a more, more control issue, but um, you have to really develop your mobility system in the body. Mobility system means this is basically uh, integration of everything, your sensory system and the, your uh, execution of the movement by uh, activating the muscles and all these things together. But if you uh, train your mobility system well, and your mobility system has enough uh, variability, this is good variability, your ability to control things. Because human body has so many joint motions allowed it. 
So you can use different combinations of these to come up with a, a pretty much a similar uh, result at the end. Okay? So if you know how to mix these things differently, but still generate similar results, that means that uh, depending on the situation, you can always manipulate these and come up with a different shot. So developing this uh, good variability is really important. In doing that, what you can do is you can change the, uh, the weight of the club, maybe one club versus two clubs, yeah. or sometimes a kettlebell or a rope. So you can uh, change these things and let your body have a full control. So uh, you I develop th your, your, your mobility system. I, th I think what comes out of this is that historically in golf, it's been taught in positions this position, this position, this position, this position. Yeah. The reality is that, that you have to move. You have to create the whole motion, but you have to start with the right movements to create. Yes. Because all the problems are, you know, whether we're looking at a beginner or, or, or you're talking about a high-level player on the PGA Tour, they can always be more efficient or because the movement's in a better order and they're, they're using the, the, the floor and the ground mm. in the right way to make the, the whole motion work. Yeah, the golf swing is a, a dynamic movement. And the dynamics means that you have acceleration, deceleration. And when you multiply mass to uh, acceleration, then it becomes the force. So what we sense is perhaps uh, the force generated. So even if you look like uh, you have similar body positions, but depending on the history of uh, motion to reach that position, you are actually experiencing very different acceleration profiles. That means you are experiencing very different uh, forces acting on your body. So when we develop the, uh, the mobility system well, then the body senses all these things and then reorganize the, the motion so they put the, the minimum burden on, on the body. So uh, the, the exact opposite trend is uh, you uh, fix a uh, certain body part and then just to use, upper, for example, you uh, fix the lower body and then just to try to use the upper body. Then what happens is you are going exactly opposite direction. Yeah. So uh, the reason why I oftentimes say that the best way to uh, find the good flowing motion is just to repeat the swing back and forth many times. As you do this by instinct, this is actually inscribed in our DNA. So uh, by instinct, we know how to minimize the burdens on the body by restructuring, reorganizing the movement. So all I do when uh, I have uh, golfers, I just give them an opportunity to break out of the, their barrier, okay, the, their habit. So by asking them to uh, do the backswing really fast, like crazily fast. Oh. I don't think anyone wants it to end tonight. Ah, here he is. There we go, perfect. I'm glad everyone's enjoying it. Ah, Mr. O'Leary, thank you. Okay, oh, I'll we're back on. Change it. Back. The, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Probably this is what happened, but uh, when uh, some swing models were uh, developed, I think they, looked, they relied on the positions a lot by using the images and things like that. So, for example, uh, at, the, at the top position where your body is, you know, sometimes you can just uh, say uh, your body is uh, centered or you are shifting your body a little bit toward the target or away from the target based on the, the image, still image at the top. But let's say even if your, your body is slightly shifted toward the target at that position, whether you are directly going in that direction during the backswing or you move away from the target and then 
quickly move toward the target and then reach that position. So depending on what you do to reach that position, that makes a huge difference. But uh, if you don't see how the motion progresses during the backswing, and just to look at the, the position at the top, then you can come up with the incorrect uh, interpretation. And then, uh, so the, the position-based uh, uh, instructions and position-based swing models, they can be quite misleading. So you have to look at how, how the body moves to reach that position. And then also, remember, even the top of the backswing, that's a point you pass through. It's not your, your goal. Your, it's not your target position. But you're basically in, in a continuous motion, you are passing through the depth position. So uh, you have to clearly understand the meaning of a particular position and what's happening at that position. And, and really, it, 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 you know, there's, there's so much going on in the transition because we're already moving forward. Our body's already rotating back the other way to, to start to create that motion. It doesn't make sense then for us to stop in practice. But actually, when you stop, then you lose the, the momentum from yeah, the back swing. So, uh, yeah, you, was, you lose the effect. Yeah. If I was practicing my swing hitting shots and I was stopping, then swinging, I, I'd lose all my dynamics that hmm. I, I'm creating as I'm, going, as I'm going halfway back. So uh, always uh, when you practice, even if it's a shortened uh, version, so you don't have a full back swing and then going down swing. But if you start the swing at certain position here, the, instead of just going down, always try to add the back swing component there and then going down. Yeah. So always keep that the end of back swing in, in the swing uh, you know, drill so that you can always connect the end of back swing to a down swing without pose. Okay. And that, that is just, I just think, I love it. I think that's great. I, I, I have never thought about using the rope like the club. I've never thought, and I've never thought <laughs> about putting a camera on it, on the rope, on the ball, to, <laughs> to see it, how I can move my body to, to get it on the functional swing play. And I, I think I uh... naturally lift it and drop it automatically. I think uh, golfers is uh, crazy enough to uh, try all different things. So uh, I don't know whether you can really find something completely new at this point. If you look back the, the history of golf, you know, <laughs> all the players and uh, instructors are doing different things. So probably, probably uh, it's not a uh, practical uh, goal to find something completely new. But if you go back and then see what others have done, for last uh, you know uh, century or so, and then find something that can be really useful. So you are rediscovering uh, you know the value of certain drills now based on what we understand now. Yeah. So uh, the the main difference uh, you know between the ten, uh, 100 years ago and now is that uh, we don't have uh, at that time obviously people didn't have enough scientific understanding of uh, what's happening during the golf swing. But now with all the equipment available and then all these researches that, you know, that has been done and then all the data collected, so now we have a lot better understanding of what is happening during the golf swing. So based on the scientific understanding, we can actually find the, you know, those drills really useful. And then what I uh, found was the stepping-based drills. Yeah. Yeah, and so... Uh, if, you know... The thing with it is, I think in all sports, we you train and then you perform. So there's a there's a there's a training phase and there's a performance phase. <laughs> if I had a piece of rope and I was doing, I feel like I was training. You know what I mean? And that's com that's a completely different mindset to me to then standing on the range going. I need to be in this position because I then go on the course and I do the same thing. I still think it. Whereas when I'm moving my rope, if that becomes part of my training to be able to move my body in a better way, you know, that's got to help me as a golfer become more efficient. Yeah. As long as I do the drill correct. One interesting episode I can give you is that. Um, so I now use uh, two-step drills quite a bit. So it has uh, different stages, but. Um, 
when I first saw a golfer doing the two-step swing, it's actually a, uh, she's a professional player in Korea. She's a KLPJ player. And then she's doing this in the competition for her driving. So she, she's taking two steps and then hit the ball. Uh, and then she was uh, in my, in my uh, lecture uh, at, at one point. And then so I was uh, checking her swing, see how she is swing, uh, swinging to give her some tips. And then I discovered that she was uh, using this uh, two-step swing. Wow. As soon as I saw that, I realized that this can be a really good uh, you know, method. So when I returned from Korea and I started prescribing the two-step swing to people, but at that time, my uh, mindset was, okay, we can make a lot more golfers to use this two-step swing in the competition. But I realized that it, it was not a good idea <laughs> because uh, when uh, Web Doc come to a player, he was doing the two-step swing quite well. But one time he was uh, playing for this, uh, playing in this uh, Monday qualifier, and then it didn't go that well. And suddenly he returned to his old swing <laughs> without using steps. So at that point, I realized that, okay, the two-step swing can be really useful. And then I've seen a good results with that, but using it in the competition can be too much. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, yeah. unrealistic. So that I changed my mindset. So, uh, okay, still this, this is really useful. So I can use this as a practice drill. But then somehow develop good moon pattern with the two-step swings and then bring that rhythm to your normal swing. So that's the strategy I have now. So um, going through the several uh, stages is because uh, initially in stage one, you develop really good movement pattern. Then the second stage and third stage, you start eliminating the steps, but uh, maintaining the, uh, uh, the rhythm. And then you have to bring that rhythm to your normal swing then uh, perhaps in your normal thing, you can introduce a trigger motion or something different, but uh, still you should be able to use the rhythm in your normal swing. So I, now you can, you can use the two-step swing as your pre-shot routine, that's possible, yeah. or as your warm-up uh, routine, but then uh, you, you can uh, maintain the rhythm in your normal swing. So uh, uh, last, for the last several years, uh, I have changed my strategies. And then uh, so uh, it's a, a lot more practical to... Uh, see the two-step uh, swing, swings as a, a drills, but then somehow we develop a strategy to uh, transfer the, the rhythm to your normal swing. So I've had some interesting experience uh, in, for the last several years. And, and how long do you think it would take somebody to start to see that's the difference in the results? Uh, it depends on the the coach, uh, I think. So uh, if, uh, if the coach can really see what's happening and then correctly uh, diagnose uh, the swing, uh, even during the two-step swing drills, by looking at the swing pattern, and you can, uh, if you can uh, judge whether the swing pattern is really good or not, then if uh, the coach has the, the eyes to uh, recognize a good swing pattern uh, in the two-step swing drills, it can be a matter of 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or so, uh, you know, in my experience, in these days, I spent about, at most about an hour with uh, each player, because uh, when players come to my lab for swing analysis, this overall is about three hour process. So we have a data capture uh, and then analysis and the feedback. So I explain different things uh, to the player and the coach. But then I, now I enjoy having this an hour at the end with the mm -hmm. player. So I try to restructure or reshape the, uh, I call it, I, I use the term reprogramming. So I, I like, I like uh, reprogramming the swing pattern of the player. But usually uh, I spend about an hour with the player. Some, some players, they get it right away. So uh, the, the, the rest of time is just a reinforcement of uh, you know, what I uh, explained. But some people, uh, you have to use a full uh, an hour period to really shape up the swing. In some cases, uh, an hour is not enough. So uh, you have to uh, have a bit more time. But usually, particularly it's uh, the early stage, like uh, junior players, and then uh, you know, college players, uh, uh, 
you can see the results in an hour, a big uh, change in an hour. And then if you are more established player, so playing on PJ Tour and so on, and then you are reluctant to change your swing, then it takes a bit uh, you know, more time. But uh, usually um, if you do it right, if you do it right, then you can see the results in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and then uh, an hour should be enough. But I think if you're, if we if you say that um, a lot of very good good players, a lot of their game is in their hands where they feel it. So if you start to create a bit more rhythm and a better sequence, sure, all they're going to be is surely better balanced, which gives them a better ability to deliver the facing. I believe so, but uh, the the reality is that. Uh... The top-notch players, they are really reluctant to uh, change things. So uh, even sometimes uh, they come in because they have a, a you know, history of injury, uh, back injury and things like that. And then the swing pattern basically tells me that uh, the person is uh, using upper body uh, predominantly. Then you try to change the pattern. But because they have used this pattern for so long, one, they cannot change because they, have, they are uh, used to uh, the current pattern. And two, oftentimes they, uh, they don't have enough motivation to change the swing pattern. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when you deal with uh, full-blown uh, top-notch players, you always face these issues. But the reason why I really enjoy working with the junior players, the college players, and, and then perhaps uh, those who are not at the top tour, because they have motivation. Mm -hmm. So they really try, uh, try hard. And then uh, oftentimes you will see uh, the changes, uh, you know, quite a bit in, in an hour period. And the main thing is when the player comes, it's always the best if the player comes with the coach. So because the whole process is really, uh, you know, uh, for the coach, not the player. Sometimes the player doesn't want to think, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, although the player has to have a reasonable understanding so that uh, he or she can, uh, you know, work on the swing on, on, on his or her own, but if the coach understands the concepts, then you have extra pair of uh, eyes. Yeah, yeah. Even when the parent come, uh, you know, comes with the, the group, that is even better because mm -hmm. even the parents can recognize a good swing pattern. So yeah, yeah. One, thing re one thing really interesting is, um, so as I work with the player, at some point, suddenly the swing pattern gets really good. And then my response is, oh, that's it. <laughs> but, but at the same time, you will hear the same thing from the coach and the parent. Yeah. yeah. So they have enough experience with the you know the golf. So uh, at least they recognize what's what's a good swing motion. And then uh, as soon as I recognize it, they also recognize this is good because uh, you know now uh, the, uh, the parent and then the coach all recognize the swing pattern. So when the player practices, uh, you know, they can provide the feedback. But it's not one, thing. one piece, is it? When, when, when you look at swing pattern, you know, and you, you look through the data of the swing that you've taken and you, you do the adjustments and the, the drills, it's not just one piece that, that's changing. The whole thing's changing, isn't it? Yes, 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 yes. So every, you know, if, however many different graphs you can have on the front, everyone's changing. It's not like you've changed one piece and that's the difference. You haven't, you've put something in that's changed the whole balance of everything. Yes, because all the swing components are interrelated. Because uh, the later, at the later, later stage, what you see are basically the outcome of what you do in the earlier stages and so on. So it is uh, impossible to fix uh, one thing in the swing. Of course, if it is, it is a more close to the impact, then you can certainly uh, control the uh, smaller factor uh, alone. But um, particularly when you change something in the backswing, then it affects everything that comes after that. So that's why uh, yeah, developing really good uh, backswing pattern is uh, so important because the backswing really sets the tone for uh, you know, the downswing and everything. So if you do, do the backswing right, then you automatically have a good transition phase. And then with that, you will be able to uh, start the downswing really well. And particularly in the backswing, 
if you work on the initial uh, phase of backswing, so how you start backswing, that's uh, really important. When you start the backswing right with the body, then automatically you will have a speedy and an active backswing, and that, that uh, leads to uh, good transition uh, mechanics. And then when you have a good transition mechanics, then you don't have to worry about what your body does in the downswing. All you need to pay attention to is the, the direction control because the speed will automatically come. So, you know, I see more and more cases where, um, you know, I have more successes when, when I address the, uh, the back swing. I, and I, then I, I think you probably I made a, more as a player as well. I, think yeah, I made a stupid, stupid statement. Uh, I made a stupid statement a long time ago. Um, when I initially started the uh, golf research, my main focus was downswing and then the swing play. And then uh, someone asked me, uh, what is the importance of backswing? So I said, uh, probably uh, backswing is what uh, brings uh, your club and the arms uh, on your body to the initial position of the downswing. So, so I think that's uh, what the backswing does. But actually, <laughs> now, if I get the same question now, then I'll say, oh, Belgium is everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. But I think I, so uh, I, think so I cannot take back what I said a long time ago, but I just hope that uh, that, that person just uh, forgot what I said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Gordon, that's been brilliant. Uh, I mean, thank you. I appreciate your time again. It, it's been brilliant. Everyone's been sending me messages all week saying, oh, do, no, do another one, do another one. He said he was just brilliant. And it's so enlightening to hear the, the reality, you know, of, of uh, what's actually happening. Well, I've really enjoyed well, it. Well, taking this opportunity, let me uh, advertise uh, my uh, classes a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, because you were in uh, my, uh, you know, certification class yeah. already, so you know. But um, I do have uh, golf biomechanics certification courses, uh, currently running uh, levels one and two. But... Um, so level one is uh, more fundamental. So, uh, you know, try to understand uh, golf swing in mechanical perspective. And then level two is all about the actual data collected. And then so uh, what we learn from the, the actual data. And so uh, level one is a fundamental. And then level two is uh, uh, applied. And then level three, I plan to start this year, uh, later uh, toward the, uh, the end of the year, but um, it's advanced. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm quite excited with that. Um, and then also, currently, I'm running a, a mini talk series. So as a matter of fact, this morning, I had the second episode. Um, oh, I, I said to one of my friends that you should go on it because ah. I said you will learn so much. <laughs> yeah. learn so, so much. Uh, I'm sure he went on it. There's definitely so a I'm, of people who've been logging in tonight again who've been on it. Yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with the mini talk uh, uh, lectures as well. So uh, you know, I'm trying to... Uh, do this more often, uh, you know, on the cyberspace. So uh, you, know, you will see, uh, you know, the the ads coming coming out uh, for uh, my uh, certification courses and also mini talk uh, uh, series. But uh, I think this is an excellent way to reach out more people. And you know what? So I, I have to say I did level one, and I thought it was brilliant. The only reason then, I, haven't, uh, I haven't done level two yet is because I ended up at the US Open. So that was yeah. it. But I will definitely do level two once it comes to the UK because I, I think it's brilliant. But, I think it's the, the 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 facts on the table and being able to learn what's actually happening. And I think where I see this being so much better now is that I think it's also practical to use because I think the drills are so much better now to what you can take away and then use on 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 golfers to get better. I think I think it's great. Yeah, I really uh, uh, start recognizing the, the value of some practical aspects. So, uh, you know, in the beginning, my class was almost like a college uh, biomechanics class. Yeah. But then uh, I downplayed the, the theory side and then uh, increased the uh, practical side. Yeah, yeah. So now I have uh, drills and everything. But uh, I, I think, uh, I, uh, you know, people will really benefit from uh, the, the, the different courses, whether it's a mini talk series or uh, you know, serious uh, certification courses. So uh, really, at this point, uh, this is exciting time to uh, talk about golf yeah. because we know 
so much more about uh, golf swing, uh, you know, scientifically. Yeah. And um, I I have to thank thank you for uh, giving me this chance to uh, no, speak no, with I, you. Uh, no, no, no. I thank you for coming on. I I, I, I you'd be brilliant. And it's great. I I love this. I love this. And then uh, you know when when you have uh, another topic to uh, talk about, then uh, please think, uh, let me know. Do you know yeah. what? I will think you on for next week. Yeah, so we, we have to do this more often. We will, we will do this. At the moment, I'm locked in, so I have, a, I have all the time. <laughs> so I will yeah. uh, I'll drop you a message towards the end of the week and see if you're available next week. In the meantime, I'll all right. something for us to talk about. Thank you very all much. All right. I really appreciate yeah. your time. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.